All right. Welcome back, everyone. So our last talk of the day is going to be from Jafar from Netflix. Uh, he's a, a cross-team technical lead. He's also a member of TC39, uh, the JavaScript Standards Committee. And today he's going to be, oh, there's some bullets. There you go. And today he's going to be talking a, a bit about uh, reactive extensions, how Netflix is using them client server side. Yeah. Take it away. Hi, everybody. Um, so this is really the story of how uh, Netflix solved big asynchronous problems just by thinking differently about events. This is about technology, but it's really actually about thinking differently about a problem we've you know, thought one way about for a very, very long time. Now, I'm going to rewind about three years. Um, I had uh, just joined Netflix and uh, left Microsoft. And we had quite a few challenges with our existing app. Now, we'd written a lot of asynchronous code in the Netflix app. And I think three years ago, I think most people were struggling with asynchronous programming in JavaScript. We had large JavaScript code base. And there was lots of problems in the app that could be described as asynchronous problems. So app startup, right? We might be going to the server and retrieving some services and waiting for some things to come up and load, like, for example, the player, both of which are asynchronous. Um, data access, obviously, in JavaScript is going to be asynchronous, right? Now there's animations. You got, after you get your data back, you want to do a screen transition. You've got to coordinate that. That's asynchronous. And view and model binding. When you change the model, sometimes you want to asynchronously bind to that view. Now, with asynchronous you know, code comes asynchronous problems, right? And so memory leaks. Anybody ever subscribed up to an event and forgotten to unsubscribe from that event, right? That's a real uh, fun one to track down. Um, race conditions. Right? Yeah, you're, I've got two things going. I want to wait for them both to complete. But sometimes the order switches up, went from test to production. And you've really got to worry about that, catch that sometimes. Callback hell. I think most people in this room probably understand what callback hell is. Um, complex state machines. So when we've got all this concurrency going on in our application, often what happens is we introduce state variables to try and track it. Is this, is this task done? Is this task done? All that state can be really difficult to sort of keep in the right state. So I think what happens is over time, the complexity in your application can really explode if you're trying to track each of these individual asynchronous tasks individually. So um, error handling. One of the things that we'll see is that when we do asynchronous pro programming, a lot of the affordances that we get out of our language, like try and catch, for example, aren't really that useful anymore. So just to give you an example of all of the problems we just talked about here, this is the type of code that was really we saw a lot of in Netflix about three years ago when I came on. And so what this piece of code is really doing, you don't have to look too, too closely to it. What it's doing is it's trying to play a movie. When you play a movie, you've got to do a few things. You've got to go and authorize that movie being played. So we've got to go and get a license for that movie so that we can use to decrypt it. The other thing we have to do is we have to intercept if the user hits a cancel button. right? They might want to decide they want to go away, and then we want to stop authorizing. And finally, we need to make sure that the player is actually loaded. So in Netflix, we actually have a native player component that we load asynchronously, and we have to wait for it to come up before we can play anything. So there's three things sort of going on here. So what's so hard about asynchronous programming? Well, I want to take a look at what's here in orange. What I've highlighted here are variables we've introduced into the program to keep track of whether certain tasks are done. So we see the movie ticket variable, right? Every single time either the movie is authorized or the player comes up, we check to see, do I have a movie ticket? Do I have the player loaded? Right? We have these variables that we introduce to just to track what's going on. So the other big issue with this piece of code here is that look at all this code now, and now I have to dedicate to dealing with errors, tracking whether I have an error, forwarding on that error. It's yet more variables and more state just to track what's going on. And I actually left a bug in this particular code. If you look, I attached a handler to the cancel button, and I forget to unhook that handler from the cancel button. Right? And so if they hit cancel, we want to stop the operation and just sort of send it up as an error. These are the types of issues that you really get into all the time in asynchronous programming. So how did it get so hard? How did async programming get so hard? Well, you actually have to go back 20 years to see what was so hard, why we got into this mess in the first place. Go all the way back to 1994, almost, almost 20 years to the day, actually. Uh, 1994, good year, right? We had uh, the Weezer Blue album, and you know, Speed came out. It was a super great year. Who's, who has this book right here? Right, quite a few hands. Who, who's read it? <laughs> Fewer hands. OK. Well, very influential book. 20 years ago, these so-called Gang of Four came together, and they took some of the patterns that they'd seen being used in the industry again and again, and they got together and they codified them. Right? And it became a very well-respected and influential book. And one of the pages in that book, they took all these design patterns, and they showed how they were all interrelated. 
but they made a little mistake. And that little mistake is at the heart of why async programming, I suggest, is so hard 20 years later. So we're going to forget about all these other patterns. We're going to focus on just two today, iterator and observer. So I want you to look closely. Notice that there's no relationship. They didn't even think these two patterns were related. So my question is this. What do these patterns have in common? Are they, in fact, related? I suggest that they are related. And let's take a look at how. So the iterator pattern, who's familiar with it? Who, give me a quick show of hands. Not a lot of JavaScript programmers are as familiar with the iterator pattern because we don't have iterators in JavaScript yet. The next version of JavaScript will have iterators. So I'll do a quick explanation for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with the pattern. The idea behind an iterator is it's a really a, a way of a, a data producer giving a data consumer data one item at a time. The data consumer asks the producer for an iterator and then pulls item out one at a time, just says, give me the next item, give me the next item, until the data consumer says, the data producer, excuse me, says, no more data for you. So let's take a look at an example of what that's actually going to look like in the next version of JavaScript. So I can call this get numbers function and get back an iterator. And I'm going to call next, and I'm going to get this little tuple, this little double value that gives me a, a, a number, and then it tells me whether we're done or not, whether there's more numbers or not. So this is actually how it's going to work in JavaScript 6. And so I see that we're not done, so I'm going to ask for another number. Still not done, keep asking for another number. Still not done, finally, I ask for a number and I find out I'm done. So it's just a way of a progressively, a data producer, progressively sending information to a data consumer, one item at a time. So the observer pattern, the observer pattern back then, it's really the precursor to what we know as callbacks and pub sub and things like event emitter today. For those of you who are familiar with things like event emitter from Node.js, or simply add event listener, remove event listener. If you think about it, the observer pattern has a lot in common with the iterator pattern, and they're both really about a producer sending a consumer a piece of information one item at a time. The only difference is here we give a callback to the data producer, and the data producer calls that callback and pushes information at the data consumer. The data producer is in control. So if I hook this callback up and I move the mouse, I actually get these values being sent at me. But there was a core difference. Other than whether the consu consumer's in control or whether the producer's in control of when that data is delivered, there's one core difference, one thing that the gang of four left out of the observer pattern. There's no way in the observer pattern for the data producer to say to the consumer, no more data. Right? Think about add event listener or remove event listener. Document on load. Right? Document on load is going to fire once and only once. But you have to remember to go ahead and unhook your event handler. There's no explicit message from the producer that says, by the way, I'm never going to call this call back again. That little mistake really is at the heart of why it's so hard to do async programming today. So this is what's in common about these two patterns. It's that they're both really about progressive, progressively sending information from a producer to a consumer. So let's take a close look. So this is the only difference, essentially. In the observer pattern, the producer iterates you, right? They're calling your callback and forcing information into you. So, Today, I want to ask you a question. It's the same question that was asked of me five years ago when I was at Microsoft and some of this technology was being uh, sort of developed. What's the difference between an array and an event? I submit to you both of these things are actually collections. We can think about them as collections. And if we think about events as collections, we'll find that asynchronous programming becomes so much easier. So I'm going to pause now, and I'm going to talk a little bit about JavaScript 6. I'm actually on the JavaScript 6 committee along with Jeff, some of the other folks here. And um, we want to get people excited about JavaScript 6. But this technology has nothing to do with JavaScript 6. I am showing it to you for two reasons. First, I'm on the committee. I want people to get excited about it. And second, JavaScript 6 allows you to write a lot less code to do the same thing. And it's going to let me fit a lot more code on slides. So bear with me. I'm going to show you just enough JavaScript 6 to be dangerous here. So in JavaScript 5, we could write functions like this. And in JavaScript 6, we're going to be able to sort of get rid of a lot of that boilerplate and shrink this down to this. I'll pause for applause. <laughs> yeah. So much better, right? So congratulations, you're experts. That's the end. Um, what I'm going to show you guys is that the majority of Netflix's async code is written with just a few flexible functions. And at first, they're going to seem to have absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with asynchronous programming. So bear with me. The first one. I think you all know, right? Anybody who's done any array programming knows what for each does. You pass for each a callback, it sends you the data inside the array until it's done. 
So if I was to execute this in my completely fake JavaScript interpreter embedded in a PowerPoint, you would see something like this, right? This took so long. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, who's used this function before? I'm curious. Cool. OK, so we know what it is. I'm going to speed along. Map, I take a function, I apply it to every item in a collection, and I take the results and I put it into a new collection. And that's a key thing. We're creating a new collection, not translating an existing collection. And so we can see that I'm going to get two, three, four in a new array. The original array is not modified. That's key here. So filter, I'm sure quite a few of you use filter as well. Almost the same as map, the difference is we apply this test function, which returns true or false, and only the items that pass the test make it into the new collection, unchanged. So we're going to see we can get two and three here. Those are all the items that pass the test. Concat all is a function that does not exist in JavaScript, but it'd be really easy to write. Concat all takes a two-dimensional array and flattens it by one dimension. It doesn't keep flattening it recursively until it's absolutely flat. It just takes a multi-dimensional array and makes it n minus one dimensions. So if I take this two-dimensional array and I flatten it, I'm going to get one, two, three, four. Now I want you guys to notice something. The empty collection there just disappears. That's going to become important later. So just remember that. So quick review, map, filter, concat all, right? So let's, who, who's, by the way, who's a Netflix user here? Great. OK, lots of hands. Um, who's seen this UI? This is our new Darwin UI, our, our evolution from all the A-B testing we've done in the last year. And so if you're using a, a, a modern smart TV, you'll probably see this new UI. Now, those of you familiar with Netflix probably know the Netflix model. It's pretty straightforward, right? There's a list of genres. And within that, we have a list of titles. So let's just try an exercise. Let's use map, filter, and concat all to get your favorite Netflix titles. Let's write a function to do that, OK? So top-rated movies collections. I'm going to write a top-rated films function. It's going to accept a user. Now remember, arrow means function, right? Arrow means function. It's going to accept a user. It's going to map over each of the video lists. Now it's going to take each of those video lists, and before returning them, it's going to filter them for only those that have a rating of 5. Now at the end of this process, we actually end up with a two-dimensional collection, because for each collection, we return another collection. And so how do we go from a two-dimensional collection to a one-dimensional collection? Concat all. All I have now to do is for each over the results and display them. So I'll leave that slide up there just for a second to sort of you know, land. So what would you guys say if I told you I could write a mouse drag with nearly the exact same code? Hell yeah. All right. I like the enthusiasm. Um, I want you guys to pay very close, close attention, because you, you, if you blink, you might miss it. Okay? I'm going to change this into a mouse drag. Now look closely at this code. What is a mouse drag? Well, it's all you listen for a mouse down, and then you want to capture all the mouse moves that happen until the next mouse up. What if events, instead of having this clunky interface of add event listener or remove event listener, what if they were first class collections just like arrays? And they could have methods just like arrays, like map and filter and concat all. Well, let's take a look at what I'm doing here. I'm taking mouse downs. And this mouse downs object represents all the mouse downs from here to infinity. I'm going to map over all of them. And in the previous example, we used filter to decrease the number of items in a collection. And here, for every mouse down, I'm going to map over all the mouse downs, and then I'm going to return all the mouse moves from now until eternity. Now, before I return that, I'm going to limit the number of mouse moves I return by applying a new function, which I'll explain in a moment, called take until. What take until is it does a takes a source collection and a stop collection. It returns all the items in that source collection until the stop collection fires. And so now, because for every mouse down, I've returned another collection, we have a two-dimensional collection. And how do we flatten a two-dimensional collection? Concat all. So I think in order for you to understand this, I'm just going to go one by one through these functions and explain how this is possible and what data type actually makes this possible. What's the type of mouse moves? Well, it's what we call an observable. An observable is a type we really just discovered about five years ago. And it's basically a collection over time. Now, 
you can get the observable type, and which basically is just this type with all the array functions you know and love, plus many, many more, implemented over this type in the Reactive Extensions Library. It's an open source JavaScript library you can get your hands on. It's available in a variety of different languages. There's actually many more than are up here now in the bullet points. People are porting it all the time. And let's just, why is this such a powerful type? Well, it's so powerful because it can model the three most common things that we do in user interfaces. User interfaces are, work like this. You get an event, you maybe make an asynchronous request, and you might respond by doing some animation. Observable can model all three of these ideas and seamlessly compose them together. So how do I go from the old event interface to this observable type? Well, this. I can convert any add event listener, remove event listener API into an observable, like that. So event subscription, we can see how, this is how I hook up to an event, add event listener, remove event listener. Here's the equivalent with an observable. I call for each. If an event is a collection, right, all I have to do is traverse that collection. And that's the same as subscribing to an event. It's going to invoke my callback. The difference between the observables for each method and arrays for each method, well, there's a few differences. But the key one is that arrays for each method blocks, and it fires you all the data in that array immediately. The observables for each method just fires your callback when that data comes in over time. And so it can be asynchronous, for example. Now notice, when we for each, we get this little object back, this subscription object. Now this isn't too, too different than when you do a set timeout or a clear interval. You get this little handle back on your subscription. If you want to stop listening, if you want to say to the data producer, in this case the observable, I don't want any more data from you, you can dispose of the subscription, and that's equivalent to removing an event listener. So is that clear how for each works? So, for each has actually got a couple more tricks up its sleeve. And this is where we see that we've closed the gap between what the iterator can do and what the observer pattern can do. In the observable, when you for each, you can pass two more optional callbacks. One of them is an error callback, which means that if during that query that you've written, during that expression you've written, an error occurs anywhere, it gets forwarded up to where you for each over it, and you can catch it. And the effect is essentially like a try catch. So you can write this very, very large map filter concat all expression, and then only when you for each over it do you have to catch that exception with this callback here. Finally, we have one more callback, and this is what closes the loop between the iterator pattern, which we've understood really, really well for 20 years, and the observer pattern, which we're only now beginning to fully understand. The ability for the producer to say to the consumer, by the way, no more data. So that third callback gets invoked when, and that's basically a way of telling you, as the consumer, we're never going to invoke your callback ever again. That tiny little callback actually can very much change fundamentally the way we approach event-based programming. And I'll show you that in just a second. But before, before we go on, I'll be going to explain each of those methods which I showed you before in detail and how they work over observable. Now, I'm going to, to do that, just because it's more visually easy to understand, I'm going to introduce a new fake literal syntax. This is not in JavaScript 6. But if I was to introduce a fake literal syntax for observable, it would look something like this a collection over time. So all of the same functions that work on this array work on this observable type, this collection over time. So if I for each over this, we're going to see the exact same thing happen. Right? The only difference is the data will arrive over time. Right? Make sense? Now what about map? Exact same thing all over again. We only translate that data as it arrives. And what we get out is an observable of the translated data. Filter, same thing. Fewer items in the collection be than before. Now, concat all is where things get interesting. So we, concat all is essentially the only way that you can flatten a two-dimensional array. Right? There's only, you got a two-dimensional array, really only one way to flatten it, top to bottom, left to right. Just go down, flatten it. When you have a collection of collections over time, what, is, what about an observable of observables? Well, because of this element of time, there's more than one way to flatten an observable of observables. Now, concat all allows us to deal with race conditions. So if you hook up a uh, an event listener to an event and then hook it up to another event, it doesn't matter in which order you registered your subscription. You're essentially going to get data from each of those events at any sort of interval. Right? Whenever it arrives, you're going to get that data. What concat all allows us to do is to enforce order. I can create an observable of observables and make sure that the data comes out in the order in which the collections came along rather than the order of the data inside of it. So I'll show you what I mean here. 
So we listen to this outer observable. We for each over this outer observable. And then what comes along? Well, soon an inner observable comes along, and we for each over that. Just like we would for each over an array of arrays by doing a nested for each, we can flatten an observable of observables by doing a nested for each. So this tiny internal collection comes along. We immediately return the data because it's, it's the first observable that's come along. Next, another observable comes along. We for each over that. We start listening to that. We immediately return data as it comes out. But while we're waiting for that observable to return data, another observable comes along. So we're still waiting for three, but another observable has come along. Now notice this observable is empty, and so it's just going to disappear, right? Same thing. We're still waiting for three, and yet another observable comes along now. It gives us data, but we don't return the four. We essentially buffer up each of these observables that you see here. We don't actually for each over them. I, sorry if I misspoke earlier. All the observables, we, only, we buffer them up and for each over them in order. So we wait for the second one to complete before we for each over the next one. And so we get no data out. And then finally, we for each over this one, and we get four out. And so we essentially enforce order. And this is what helps us resolve race conditions. Now, it turns out that, all, that most asynchronous problems we have can actually be expressed as an observable of observables. And the solution to many asynchronous problems is what type of flatten do we use? There are, as I said earlier, there's more than one way to flatten an observable of observables, and this is just one strategy. So let's take a look now at the, a different flattening strategy, merge all. Merge all is like you know, five lanes merging into one. It's really the order in which the data comes out, not in which the observable collections themselves. So we see one, immediately another observable comes out, we for each over that, we get two, another one comes along, nothing. Four, we return four out of order, because it's just, it's just as soon as the data comes along, we return it. And then finally, we get three, and then we're done. And there's one more flattening pattern, and this is the flattening pattern that we use the most on UIs. It's called switch latest. Now, I want you guys to imagine that you know, your job is to write a little page that when somebody clicks a button, that goes off and gets the latest stock quote for Netflix, and then displays it. Now, if you give that to your QA person, what's the first thing that QA person's going to do? To test it. Sorry? Click the button a lot. Yes, that is what they will do. They will just jam on that button, right? Until you run out of memory. Unless you've done something to sort of cancel that outgoing request, what's going to happen is you're very quickly going to flood the number of open sockets, and you're just going to keep creating these requests, and eventually you'll run out of memory. Well, that's not ideal, right? Often, in user interfaces, we're just interested in the latest thing that the user does. And that's what switch latest does. So if I take this switch latest, it's the same as merge all. We return data in the order in which it arrives. I get this observable. I for each over it. But before I get three, another observable comes along. And then I dispose of my subscription to that previous observable. In other words, I'm only listening for data from the latest observable. So I dispose of the subscription, stop listening to it, and Finally, we get this data. And so we've actually lost data, but it's only because we're paying attention to the latest subscription. We don't care about the old data, the old thing the user's done. So those are the three ways, the most common ways, we flatten observables of observables in Netflix. And you'll find that most async problems fall into one of those three broad categories. So take until that function I explained to you guys earlier. It's the last piece you need to understand, to understand how that drag and drop worked. Well, we listen to a source collection, and we listen to a stop collection. And we just keep returning all the data from the source collection until the stop collection comes along. And then we say, we're done. No more data. We fire that on completed handler to for each. Now, take until is the reason that I have not unsubscribed from an event in the last five years. And my code is not full of memory leaks. I don't unsubscribe from events anymore. I declaratively describe the conditions under which I want my event source to just end. The thing about an observable that can tell you that no more data is coming, well, it can free your event handler for you. If you think about it, that's what document on load should do, right? As soon as it fires that event handler and it knows it's never going to fire it again, it should just free your handler. I bet there's tons of JavaScript code out there that's leaking memory from old on load handlers that people have hooked up and not bothered to unhook. I don't need to unhook my event handlers anymore. I just use take until or switch latest to just describe a stream that ends when I think it should end. So now we understand enough to understand how this mouse drags collection works. So here you can see I've taken events and I've composed them declaratively together to create a new and more complex event. 
But earlier, I told you observable could combine events, asynchronous requests, and animations. So let's take a look at a slightly more complex example. Who's ever written an autocomplete box before? Right, few hands. Not as easy as it could be, right? It's one of those things you think is going to be pretty easy, you're going to make it out by five, and then these little problems keep coming up, right? What are some of the problems with creating an autocomplete box? What's hard about it? Right, if I type A, B, C, D, E, F, I don't want five requests out, right? So we want to throttle, we want to hold back before we send up another request. What is another problem with autocomplete boxes? Waiting response back when you type. Yes, responses coming back out of order is another issue with that, right? So if I type A and we issue a request, and then I type B and we issue a request for A, B, is there any guarantee the request for A is going to come back before the request for A, B? So it's a race condition, right? A big fat race condition. So here's how I solve an autocomplete box. And I go home at 5 o'clock with Rx. I think about it as collections. So what collections do I have? Well, I have this key presses event. And that's a collection of all the key presses from now and forever, right? I'm going to take that and I'm going to throttle it. And what that does is it turns A, B, C, D, E, F into A, B, F, right? It just slows it down. Then I'm going to map over each one of those keys. And I'm going to call this get JSON function. And all that get JSON function is going to do is going to create an observable with one and only one result, which is the result that comes back from the server. It's like, a, it's like a promise. It's just an observable that happens to have one value in it. Now, I'll explain the retry operator in a moment. But notice there with take until key press, what's that going to do? Well, when I hit a key and I issue a request for A, I'm going to, create, I'm going to call get JSON, which is going to return this collection that eventually give me the results for A. But if I hit B, what happens to that observable collection that's outstanding that hasn't returned the results for A yet? Well, take until makes it empty. It just becomes empty. And then what happens to it when I run concat all on it? What happens to empty collections in a collection of collections when I run it through concat all? It just disappears. I don't think about event-based programming like a state machine anymore. I don't think of this, five years ago, I would have thought of this as a state machine. Before you click a button, you're in the waiting state. And when you click that button, you're, in, you're issuing a request. And now I'm in the issuing request state. And I got to remember to hook up you know, these event handlers and then unhook the event handlers and move between states. I don't think about it that way anymore. I think about them as collections that end when I want them to end. So for every single key, we're returning another collection, albeit a collection of one, which is the search results, which means we have a two-dimensional collection. And then I apply my, co my concat all, flatten it down to one, and we get a nice ordered list of the search results. Does that make sense? So the only thing left to do after you've built this collection of search result sets is to for each over it. Right? Every single time one of these result sets come out, I'm just going to update the DOM right? or, or re-render my React component. And here, you can see that I've added an a handler for errors. If an error occurs anywhere in here, in this particular case, it'll be get JSON, right? If we fail to hit the network, well, I'm going to ha handle that error. But notice this retry method. This is one of the powerful things about an observable that you don't get from other things like promises, for example. What retry does, it's very simple. An observable is lazy, which means not a thing here is going to happen until I call for each. Everything on the top half of this slide, all I'm doing is I'm creating observables, which hold on to observables, which hold on to observables, and nothing has actually happened yet. It's not until I for each that all those subscriptions go through this expression, and we actually start listing for key presses. Now, what happens with the retry operator is it subscribes to its source observable, in this case, the result of get JSON. If it gets an error call back out, it just subscribes again and increments a counter. And if it gets an error callback again, it subscribes again, increments a counter, until that counter has reached a higher number than three, and then it just forwards along the error. And so it makes it really easy for us to just retry asynchronous requests, which fail all the time because of you know, intermittent network failures. Does that make sense? So promises are different. When you get a promise, it's what we call a hot data source, which means it's already going. right? Promise is it's already happening. You can hook your event handler up to it, but there's no way to really cancel what's going on behind a promise. With an observable, when you dispose of your subscription object that you get back from a for each, the data producer has the opportunity to actually cancel the action. Right? Maybe that asynchronous request has been put into a queue and it hasn't been sent off yet. 
Well, that's great. We can just pop it out of the queue. And you don't have to worry about it ever being sent. And so that's how we solve that problem with the QA person jamming on that button. We use something like switch latest, and we actually can cancel requests that haven't been sent out yet. So let me just move on. Notice that in the previous example, I had map, and then I had like a take until. Well, we can get rid of this take until and this concat all and replace it with switch latest, because that's all we're doing. When you combine a take until, which is like, I've got this collection of collections, and every single time you press another key, I want to just complete this collection so nothing comes out of it. Well, that's really just mimicking what switch latest does. In this case, we just care about the latest you know, JSON request sent out by a key. And as soon as another one happens, we're just going to stop listening to that observable, which is what switch latest does. And that's why I showed you how switch latest worked earlier. So we can simplify this to this, even shorter, right? So let's do one more example, um, the Netflix player. So the Netflix player is relatively simple. Uh, you saw this horrible piece of code earlier. We're going to see what, what observable can do for this piece of code. So in this world, I'm going to think about player initialization as an observable of one. It's just a collection of one, like an array with one number in it. And when it fires, I'm going to map over that, and then I'm going to listen for all of the attempts to play. And that's really just a stream of movie IDs that the user is trying to play. Then I'm going to map over that. And I'm going to attempt to authorize each one of those movie IDs, which will return me an and yet another observable of one, like a promise, that's basically the authorization. Now notice I can do this catch and return observable empty here. What that does is if we get an error, we return another collection that we just pick up where we left off. And what that does essentially is suppress errors. Because if you, if you, if you sort of error halfway through an, uh, a collection, we just resume with an empty collection, which means we just complete normally. And then we take until cancels. We listen for that cancels event. And while we're waiting for an authorization to occur, if a cancel happens, we just complete that collection. So no, no authorization actually ends up coming out of it. And since we're about three levels deep here, because for every init, we're going to return all the play attempts and then return all the authorizations, we just call concat all twice to flatten that on down. And then we just listen, and what pops out is this nice stream of licenses, ready to play movies. Every time one comes along, we start playing that movie. And if we have an issue, we show a dialog that says something went wrong. Now notice, we shouldn't ever have an issue here because of I've applied catch. If I got rid of catch, I would need this line down here. But because I'm essentially suppressing errors, I don't actually need that last line, that error handler, because no error will actually escape. So you don't have to just catch exceptions down here. You can catch them and handle them, just like you could, for example, with try catch. So now, at Netflix, we use observable pretty much everything. And when I say pretty much everything, I mean everything we do asynchronously on the client, but also everything we do asynchronously on the middle tier. When you click a button in Netflix, we are going to send a request to a server somewhere, and that essentially gets turned in to an observable of one, to an observable of a request. And then we go and request data from the back end, all of which comes back as observables. And we combine them all together into one big observable. We for each over it, take the data, and send it out over a stream. If you look at Netflix's middle tier code, it's nothing but observable. It's building one big observable, for reaching over it, taking the string that comes out or the multiple strings that come out and push it down the stream. So it's mutation at the edges as we read off the stream and write to the stream, and nothing but map, filter, reduce, merge, zip in the middle. So we've fully separated the code that changes things, that's the for each, where we take the data out of the collection and we change the world from the code that translates data, map, filter, right? That doesn't change anything, but creates a new collection. So here's the exercises that we actually use at Netflix to train. The technology is great. This is great technology. I assure you it can be really, really powerful when you use it in a system. But an even harder problem, as from my perspective, than the technology was training our developers to think, essentially, without loops. Really, that's, that's, a, that's one way of thinking about this problem. That's one way of summing it up. How can I do collection transformations? How can I work with collections without ever using a loop? If you can figure out a way to do that, you can translate not just in memory collections like arrays, but you can use the same operators to translate events and have one essential model for dealing with collections no matter what type of collections those are, whether that data is being pushed at you or whether that data you're pulling data out of a data source, whether it's pull or push. All of these functions work on iterators and the observers, the observable, excuse me. So 
have a look at these exercises. This is what Netflix uses in-house to train our developers. It's a series of in, you just fill it out in JavaScript. They're like little unit tests that you can fill out right there on a web page. Try them out. And this is what we essentially have used to train hundreds of developers, actually, both internally and at conferences and doing some consulting. So um, this is something that we're driving towards. This is not yet complete, not, not even accepted at this point. But this is the, thing that, the type of thing that we'd like to see in JavaScript 7. Um, we're moving through that process, obviously. But it would be great if we could have support for this thing in JavaScript 7. And start, you, this is sort of like a very early picture of what you might see in JavaScript 7 to use this observable if it's native. So for those of you who are unaware of the async await proposal for JavaScript 7, it's just an easier way of having you do async programming and making it look synchronous. And so this is the type of code you might be able to write if everything goes to plan in JavaScript 7 um, to natively work with these observables using this new for on loop. So I think I'm a little early here, but uh, do we have any questions? I'm all done. Yeah, we have some time, so let's open it up for questions. Um, so I think this is great. Thanks for this is a great review. I'm personally been a big fan of observable pattern. I've used it throughout my career. Um, but uh, what would you think? Uh, can you come up with an example of a model or maybe an uh, example where this doesn't work as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so let me see. If I had to deal with a push data source, in other words, data is being fired at me. Um, I would say most times where you're dealing with some sort of event, an observable is the right API to use, not event, add event listener, remove event listener. That add event listener, remove event listener is a weaker contract. It's basically just a notification, not of any particular type. Nobody can tell you they're done. But sometimes that's really the API you need. Sometimes really all you need is a simple signal, and then you're done. Generally, I would recommend you know, against using this API too early and only move to an API like that, I think it's premature optimization to use this simple pub sub API. Most of the time, for most applications, you actually want this notion of a completion semantic, an error occurred semantic, and this data semantic, because as you can see, it allows you to declaratively sequence events together. As soon as you only have this simple notification, like, yeah, something happened, well, as soon as you've got to sequence things, it becomes a hard problem all of a sudden, and you need to use state machines to do it. And so in a highly performance critical scenario where you, say, could only afford to allocate a single callback, maybe, you're really worrying about memory, um, I would say so. But I would say the vast majority of scenarios, it's really premature optimization. It's a very simple contract. It's like adding three event handlers to an event versus one, right? And being able to find out when something finished or something aired. So I, I, Basically, we, just to give you some, some context here, Netflix, we run on incredibly resource-constrained devices. Um, Set-top boxes. We've taken this model and made it work in, you know, on devices. Like, I feel like every few weeks, you know, my manager runs into my office holding like a chip attached to a wire and saying, can you make Netflix run on this? You know? <laughs> it really is like that. And so you know, we've made this model work on set-top boxes that are very, very inexpensive. Right? In our world, Hardware's not getting faster, it's getting slower, which is not something I would have, would have you know, anticipated. And so I, I would say don't be too concerned about performance at first anyway. Go ahead and use this model because we've made it work in very resource constrained environments. Yep. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, not the, uh, uh, I don't, I'm not technical enough, but it uh, um, seems like uh, this, is, this will be in, in JavaScript 7, but how can you use it today? Oh, well, so the reactive extensions library. So first of all, it will not necessarily be in JavaScript 7. This is wishful thinking on my part. I am on the JavaScript 7 committee. Um, but we have a series of stages for proposals in JavaScript 7. And it is like the first of three stages. And so um, you know, don't wait for JavaScript 7 to use this. There's no good reason to do that. There's an open source GPL Apache library, sorry, Apache library excuse me, you can use right now. It's the reactive extensions library. Um, you can see it right up here. RxJS, go to GitHub, go get it. It's open source, you know, not encumbered. Go ahead and use it. Hi, uh, I have a question about the slide uh, uh, of uh, JavaScript seven. Mm -hmm. So, is there a name for that pattern, uh, like async await uh, combination? 
What, what's the inspiration behind this? Ah, so um, I hadn't planned to talk too much about it, but I, I can. Um, so as for, for those of you who are familiar with Promises, Promises are coming out in JavaScript 6. And so the async await is actually a special syntax to make it easier to work with Promises. And basically what it makes it do is it looks like, it makes it look like you're just working with synchronous code. So where you see awaits here, like in this example, let line equal await reader dot read line, what it's doing is it's actually taking a, a callback and it's doing promise.then, and it's just sort of switching it around to, to make it look like it's synchronous. But actually, that piece of code from let line and, and moving on will only continue after that promise is fulfilled. Now, who's familiar with function star in the next version of JavaScript? So a few hands. Function star is this notion of the iterator I talked about earlier. So if you want to create a function that returns multiple values, you can put a star in front of it in JavaScript 6, and then you can use this yield keyword that you see there on line 6. And you can go yield 1, yield 2, yield 3, and what comes out when somebody calls that function is an iterator. And that's the example I showed you. And it's really a way of having a function return multiple values. Well, what happens when you have an asynchronous function that returns multiple values? Well, the plan is for an observable to come out. If there is a function star and there is an async function, I submit there must be such thing as an async function star. And we think that's an observable, but that has yet to be seen. So this example demonstrates how you might use, in Node.js actually, combine various streams of data and then send it out over an asynchronous stream and support things like back pressure. Other questions? Cool. All right, well, let's thank Jafar one more time. So the only thing we really have left is happy hour, which is exciting. Um, that's going to be on the fourth floor, so one level down from here. You can also pick up some swag um, there. I think we have shirts and some things for everyone. And then on your way out, just tap the, the iPad, green, yellow, red, uh, kind of rate this track, if you wouldn't mind, on your way out. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>